Thank you for joining our webinar today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, as I said before, just as a little bit of housekeeping, we'd love for you to introduce yourself in the chat, maybe let us know what your particular interest is around performance right at this particular time. Um, let us know what's on your mind, what's going on. And then if you have questions as we go through the presentation, please use the Q&A tab in the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask those questions. Um, and you should be able to also comment on and upvote other folks' questions as well. And so we'll use that to keep track at the end. And in the meantime, feel free to chat with uh, each other in that chat window and with us panelists. Um, so to formally get started, this is a joint webinar between Tag1 Consulting, a Drupal Association certified partner, uh, Google, an organization, of course, we all know um, that has been partners with both Tag1 and the Drupal Association, and the Drupal Association itself. We are the 501c3 that supports the Drupal Project, the nonprofit organization that gathers and convenes folks who are doing amazing things in the community and helps empower and enable the next generation of Drupal. Today's topic is revolutionizing performance testing in Drupal with Gander. Uh, so especially if you were not able to attend the recent DrupalCon Portland, and you may have heard rumblings about Gander and what this concept is, we hope this session will help get you up to date, give you a chance to ask some questions, get oriented, and maybe give you what you need to start trying out Gander for some of your projects. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'll do a quick round of introductions here. So my name is Tim Lennon. I'm the CTO at the Drupal Association and Hestinet on Drupal.org. I'm joined by Giannis from Tag1, who's the Strategic Growth and Innovation Manager, uh, Adam Silverstein, Developer Relations Engineer at Google, and a co-presenter with us in the Drupal community on several occasions to talk about performance, uh, and also a maintainer over at the WordPress side as well, so multiple aspects of open source. And finally, Nat Catchpole, a Senior Architect and Technical Lead at Tag1, Core Release Manager, Maintainer, and uh, as you'll see later in this pr uh, presentation, one of the very early advocates for some of the ideas that we're exploring here. Uh, so without further ado, I think I'll hand it over to Giannis to take us through this and uh, talk through this new tool for performance measurement. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, hi, everyone. Really glad to be here. I'm sorry I have my light on my face, but I really can't do much about it because I already closed the windows and it's still there. Um, but you probably won't be looking at my face much. So we're talking about performance here. Um, and first thing that we need to, first uh, question that we need to answer is why do we, do we even bother about performance? Um, it sounds obvious, but then sometimes we realize that it's really not. And um, there are many reasons why we should and do care about performance. Uh, probably the biggest one is that slow websites turn away users, uh, which in turn uh, causes us to lose money or to uh, not achieve what our goal is. Like not everybody is running a website to make profits. We have different goals. But no matter why you're doing it, uh, you have some goal in mind. And if your users are not uh, engaging with your website because the website is too slow, then you're not achieving your goals. And that's really sad because you probably invested quite a lot of time and money and energy into the website. And if it's not uh, doing what it's supposed to do, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a waste. Um, then besides that, um, page speed is a ranking factor for search engines. There are no official, um, you know, statements about that, but it's pretty obvious. I like to say that, um, whatever is good for the user will probably boost your ranking. Um, and performance is one of those things. So, uh, again, just like the previous one, if we were, if we were, uh, turning users away with the previous argument, now we are not you know, attracting as many users as we could. And then just like a comparison with uh, real life, like who of us likes to stand in line in a bank or in a grocery store or whatever it may be. 
Um, and with slow website, we effectively um, force our users to do that. Um, the problem with performance, if it's being neglected, it, that if it is neglected for a long time, problems usually pile up and then it becomes a really hard to fix. Uh, so it's always better to be conscious about performance from the beginning and not allow all this technical debt to accumulate over time. Um, and um, I come from the backend world, so and and I'm guilty myself of this. Uh, I know that a lot of us used to think about performance only in terms of time to first byte, like about the backend performance. But this it's so much more than that. Uh, front end is heavier, heavier, more and more important because we want to make our websites interactive. Um, so we also have to think about that aspect of it. Time to first byte is great, um, but also everything that happens after that, it's really, really important. Um, and at the end of the day, it's also about sustainability. Uh, slow websites use more CPU power, which uses more energy in the data centers where it's being run. Um, and if we have slow client side applications, they uh, use more energy on client side. And uh, it might not sound like a lot, but uh, it adds up, especially if you have a lot of traffic. So these are all really good reasons to care about performance. Uh, there are probably more, um, but I think that, I hope that I convinced you. So a few words about the history, the history of Gander, the, the framework that we are, we will be talking about today. Um, a few years ago, we were approached by Google Chrome team um, and very bold goal that Chrome team has is to make the internet faster. Um, and their main metric are core web vitals. Um, and with Core Web Vitals, we're coming back to uh, that discussion about backend performance versus frontend performance and how we have to capture everything. Core Web Vitals uh, aim to do that, like to aim everything in a few understandable uh, metrics that we can all follow and understand. Um, Google Chrome team works with major open source platforms because um, you know if you improve WordPress or even Drupal, um, then you automatically improve a lot of sites on the internet. Um, and we started our collaboration by adding uh, image and iframe or embed lazy loading into Drupal core. So if you if you update it to nine point five and for some things to ten then you can, when you are configuring visibility of your images and embeds in core, you can now opt in for lazy loading. Um, and that's something that was born and created out of this uh, collaboration. And after that first round, we, we discussed what we could do next. And um, this is how Gander was born. But before I dive into Gander, I would like to hand it off to Adam to tell us a little bit more about what they're doing. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Yanez. That was great, set me up perfectly. So Google's lofty mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That last part, universally accessible and useful, implies an open web that users can have a good experience on when they're looking for and finding information. And that's why Chrome created this Core Web Vitals initiative several years ago, really as a way to try to provide tools to measure user experience on the web, not just performance, but actually how does the site respond when you interact with it? Is it janky? Are things moving around once it loads? So Core Web Vitals aims to get at kind of how users experience your site. And we all know and study after study shows um, that improving user experience improves engagement, imp improves loyalty. It's going to lead directly to better business results. So that is ultimately what we're hoping for people to have a better experience on the web. And one thing I wanted to mention on Core Web Vitals, this year we introduced a new web vital called uh, INP or um, Interaction to Next Paint. And this is our new measurement of interactivity. Uh, it replaces the previous one that wasn't doing a good job of measuring poor experiences that we all know we have on the web. 
Um, so if you're doing performance work, definitely encourage you to dig into this new metric. It's a little more challenging to debug and it's difficult to test using automated tests because it really is a, a field metric. Um, so for automated tests, we have to use kind of proxy measurements like total blocking time. Next slide. So I wanted to give an update briefly about some of the work we've been doing in WordPress core where I also work um, before I pass it back to Giannis to talk about Gander, which I'm really excited to hear about. Um, one of the big challenges over in WordPress has been the consistency of our automated tests, getting them to produce consistent results, especially for more variable metrics like uh, LCP. Um, it's difficult to create a consistent environment. And we have both manual and um, automated tests that we use. So the manual tests we use to compare individual commits against each other as a way of kind of debugging problems when we find them. And this has been a big ongoing challenge for us is figuring out how to do that. That's something we're really focused on this year is trying to expand the tests and also make them more consistent. Um, similarly, we're, we're trying to get more adoption in the ecosystem. We realize that the core WordPress product is only a part of the performance puzzle. There's all these plugins that users need to create the, the functionality that they have on their site. So we're encouraging, you know, big, especially the bigger plugins that are widely used in the themes to adopt some sort of performance testing, either automated or manual testing of releases. And it's challenging. Um, it's hard to convince developers both that it's worth the effort to invest the time in it. And also there's just a huge diversity of uh, different approaches that people use for testing, for, for building their products. And we're trying to help them out with tooling, but we found that there's just so many different ways people do things that it's hard to provide a consistent, easy to use tool that, that uh, plugins can just pick up and start using. Um, one thing we've been doing, I think a better job of is trying to measure the impact of changes that we make uh, in the core product and how they impact performance in the field after they're released. Um, so for example, we recently added AVIF support into WordPress Core. This is a new modern image format that's much more efficient than JPEGs. And we'll be measuring how many sites uh, adopt using AVIF as their primary image format and also how that impacts their Core Web Vital pass rates. And we do that using publicly available data like HTTP Archive and the Crux data set, which we can query, we can build dashboards or collabs and really try to see how, uh, how we're impacting overall performance. And features that we try to land in core are things that we think will, will benefit all sites, right? It's not just something that uh, you turn on and it, it affects your site. It's something that we want to land that's going to actually affect everyone. Um, so to test out new features, we have this thing called the Performance Lab plugin. And in there, we, we've got multiple features. There's sort of sub plugins that exist. And each one has its own meta generator tag. So we can get them out in the wild. Uh, like we're testing right now um, the uh, speculation rules API, which is a great way to provide instant navigations for secondary navigations on the site. And we can get the, the features out there and get them tested in the wild and collect data. And that gives us a point of reference and an argument for either including them in core or maybe deciding that they aren't worth inclusion. So. Those are the big things we're working on in WordPress, and I am going to pass it back to Yana so we can hear more about Gander. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> it's great to hear that there's all these exciting things that are happening um, you know, with I'd WordPress to, and with Google. I'd love to chime in just briefly because uh, Adam highlighted a couple of cool things in that, uh, among other things the concept of AVIF support and advanced image support. And it's hard to understate how much, I mean, we, we go into JavaScript interactions, we go to the new interactive to next paint metric, all these other things, but it's, it's hard to overstate how important just pure image like load uh, has an impact on a lot of this sort of front end performance stuff. And things like um, AVIF, WebP, other kinds of support are definitely a big deal. So in prior collaborations, we also, you know, got WebP support landed. Um, there is AVIF support for core that is a work in progress that also started out of this collaboration between the, the DA and Google. I've linked that in our chat. Um, so if we want to help get that over the finish line as well, that's something we can do. And of course, there's also a contrib project that helps uh, get you there a little earlier if you're ready to go. So anyway, just wanted to note some of those things if you're interested in some of those concepts as well. But Yanis, please take it away. So now finally, let's talk about Gander, uh, which is uh, automated performance testing framework for Drupal. 
Um, 15 years ago, uh, Catch, who is with us on this webinar, opened an issue um, to discuss adding automated testing uh, to Drupal. And now we finally have it. And I think that just recently, Catch closed this issue as done. Because um, there's obviously more work to do, more metrics to add, but now we have automated performance testing in course. So it was a uh, finally time to close this issue. Um, so why, why automated performance testing? First of all, it's a long-term investment. Um, the results, while some results uh, were, were appeared very quickly, um, it will take some time to, to, to really reap all the benefits. But on the other hand, uh, imagine not having like functional or unit testing in Drupal in like 2024. Um, like it's almost unimaginable to develop Drupal or you know, modules or even some some client websites without these tools. Um, it took us a while to get used to it, to figure out how to do it effectively, but now we wouldn't be able to live without it. And I think that performance testing uh, falls in the same category. Um, before we introduced automated performance testing, we did do performance testing. We did it manually, which is cumbersome and time consuming. So for that reason, it was only done occasionally. Um, and um, it was usually done by like maintainers, committers, who are people that are already very busy with other things. So it was chipping away their precious time as well. Um, and since we didn't have any standardized performance testing procedures, um, we also got inconsistent results, um, which is which is not great because then you cannot compare apples to apples. And sometimes um, we could even see that there were things that were tested were like plain wrong. Like if if we were trying to test effects of of something that is only noticeable on an uncached or a page with cold caches. And if you performance test with caches enabled and hot, then you really won't be getting any meaningful results. Um, and we've seen that happen. Um, then another issue with main manual testing, especially because it was only done rarely, is that issues were often detected only when they got into a release, got deployed to you know live websites, and then somebody noticed it there. And that's not ideal. Um, and automated performance testing fixes all of those problems. Um, and that's why it's great. And we, we really want to start using it. And uh, the best way to do that is to learn and include it in our culture. If just as we adopted functional testing as part of our culture, and now we know that there is a bug, and we fix the bug, we will always add a test to make sure that this bug doesn't reappear. We should do something similar with performance testing. Um, so how does Drupal core use it? Um, with performance tests, we can now assert on, um, on performance metrics. So we can assert the number of database queries, number of uh, cache requests, things like that. Um, when we are writing new tests, we add those. Um, as we will see, the performance test is basically just a little bit smarter functional JavaScript test. So we can really start adding performance assertions to any JavaScript test. Um, and especially when we're fixing performance regressions, we are adding assertions that make sure that these regressions do not reappear. Um, and we have uh, tests that are running on a regular schedule every 15 minutes on active branches. And then data from this test is sent to a, a dashboard where we can observe long-term trends. 
uh, and that dashboard is available publicly to everyone on candor.tech1.io. Um, so it's there for you to use it. Um, you can only use it when you're writing tests and add um, assertions to them. If you're interested in long-term trends, and definitely check out the dashboard. And and just, just one thing to one thing to add is that these are um, it's just using PHP unit. So if you're writing PHP unit tests, you already know how to write the tests. Um, and then uh, because it's PHP unit, all of the setup for the scenario that you need to test, that's all standard PHP unit as well. So creating nodes, if you need to visit a page to warm some caches, visit another page and just to warm the remaining caches, you can do all of those kinds of things. Um, it's it's just all sort of things you would do for any other PHP functional test, you can do it for performance testing too. So yeah, nice. Yep, thank you. As I mentioned earlier, we already managed to get some really interesting and nice improvements into Drupal Core as a direct result of Gander being part of it. And by far the biggest one is um, it's it's a performance regression that was actually um, not that bad for live websites. It's related to flawed uh, backend creating tables for what it needs to do. Uh, but since creating these tables were not optimal, um, we were creating them over and over again when running tests. And just by fixing that, we reduced the runtime of the core test suite for 10%, which is a lot considering how many tests we're running, how many developers are waiting for these results, so we like to say that just with this improvement, Gander, Gander probably paid for itself in which if we consider all the CPU time that we saved and all the developer time that we also saved. Um, but then we also found improvements in logging and auth procedure where we were loading things from the database multiple times where we really, really only needed to do it once. Um, Catch was in the early Gander development. Catch was able to identify that Umami has a pretty terrible, uh, largest con contentful paint, uh, which was caused by uh, the main hero image, which is huge, being loaded twice for no reason. Um, and then other things, uh, the uh, improvements to JS and CSS aggregation are also interesting um, that should affect practically every Drupal website. Um, so I think that this proves that Gander is useful and that it's already bringing results. And I'm excited to see what else it will help us improve in the future. Um, like these are all issue IDs. So if you want to check these issues out, just well, check those. Um, so what is Gander? Um, Gander is basically a base test class. It's called performance test base, um, which is, as I mentioned already, it's a, a, a version of functional JavaScript test. Um, and it adds performance metrics collection on top of the standard JavaScript test. It is in Drupal core since 10.2. So if you are on 10.2 or greater, uh, you already have it. Um, and since it's a JavaScript functional test, it's also uh, any any JavaScript test can easily be converted to become a performance test. Um, if for some reason you don't like the base class, base class uh, is essentially just using the trait, which has a lot of like all the performance testing logic in it. So you can also create your own base test class. Um, with that trait if you need to. One, one reason why we would want to do that that comes to mind is if you are using what is called external existing site test, uh, that is a, a module if you don't want to reinstall uh, your site every time when you're testing, if you want to test on UAT site or something like that instead. So if you would wanna add support for performance tests to that, you could use that trait. Um, it is collecting metrics that are related both to backend and frontend. 
Um, we're collecting uh, time to first buy, then some core vitals um, with the number of database queries and the whole list of database queries. Um, and then cache requests, number of JavaScript files, um, DSS files. And I think that <clears throat> now we are also collecting the size of JavaScript files and CSS files, Fetch, am I correct about that? I think that I should- Yeah, that's that. only in 10.3, but we but we added it. So we um, we go over all of the files on the page and we add, we add them up, how big they are. Um, yep. And that's- uh, Yeah. And it's not just informational, like if they get bigger without us noticing, the test will actually fail on CI. Like it, it tells us what happens. Yeah. And this was added related to those issues that I mentioned before, where we managed to shrink the size of these files quite a lot. And we wanted to make sure it stays that way. Um, so now let's move to the question that probably brought all of you here, um, how to use it. Um, so we can use Gander in two ways. I already touched on this before, um, but um, the first and really very straightforward way of using it, especially if you're already using tests and you're familiar with JavaScript tests, is to start adding assertions on performance metrics. Um, you can do this in any JavaScript test. Um, and um, this way, you will ensure that performance regressions don't sneak in unnoticed. Um, it's better to do this on deterministic metrics, um, like number of database queries, number of cache requests by type, ideally. Um, size of, of your JavaScript and CSS assets. Um, you could do it for time to first byte or like LCP in theory, but those numbers will always fluctuate at least a little bit. Um, so you could assert on a range, for example, like you're expecting your time to first byte to be between 250 and 300 milliseconds, for example. Um, but you will, depending on the environment where the tests are running, these numbers will be different and will fluctuate a little bit. So you will get false positives or even false negatives. So it's really like in some cases, maybe it makes sense to do that as well. But um, for most use cases, it's probably better to stick to the deterministic metrics. Uh, they will always give you the same number. Uh, so you can be sure that the test will behave as you want it to be. And this is uh, a, a part of the test. Like this is, uh, I took the code out of the test function and this is how it looks. Like for everybody that already uh, wrote any type of functional test reading Drupal, these first two lines are familiar. We're basically navigating um the the pages we're navigating the front page and then the login page and this lines at the beginning um are we can still assert on other things like assert content of the page or anything like that but we are not collecting uh, performance metrics in those two first steps yet when we start collecting performance metrics is with this next call that we have here, which is a call to function called collect performance data. And then we pass in a closure where we do additional navigation on the site. And everything that happens inside of this closure, will, we will collect performance metrics for. And then this performance metrics will end up in the performance data um, variable, which is a special class that we have to, to store these metrics. And now that we have these metrics, we can insert on them. Um, as I said, we are collecting the list of all the data queries that happened on the site. So first thing that we do, we assert that 
match the, the queries that we recorded are the same as the queries that we're expecting on this page. So if um, any new queries run or if any is missing, um, this will fail. And then we also assert on the query count and um, cache requests by different type um, and so on and so on. And it's it's as easy as that. It basically looks as at any other functional test. Um, and of course, you don't need to only assert on performance metrics in a test. You can mix it with standard assertions just like you are doing them uh, already. Um, and then the second way of using Gander is to monitor metrics over time. Um, and this is what we mentioned before Core is already doing. Uh, it's running uh, performance tests regularly, collect metrics and send it to a dashboard, which then allows you to uh, track the long-term trends. Um, it's using open telemetry. We are using Grafana with Prometheus and Tempo as backends, but anything that can, can speak uh, open telemetry can be used really if you don't like Grafana for any reason. Um, and this is a screenshot from, from the dashboard that we have. Um, on the left side, we see the long-term the, like the long metrics. And on the right side, we can see each individual trace um, that happened uh, in this time frame that we're currently displaying. And then if we click on the trace, uh, we, can, we can see the entire trace and we can see like all the queries, all the cache requests in here you know, in the timeline. Um, and this is something that um, Catch uh, I know uses a lot and was able to identify many of those issues that we found just using this data here. Um, so very useful. Um, we would like to invite you to start using Gander today. Um, it's really easy, especially if you're already using tests. It can be used with core, it can be used with contrib, it can also be used on your custom project. So uh, it's not that it's only limited to core or anything like that. Um, we have uh, a docs page on Drupal Wiki, which is the left link slash QR code. Um, the short link will only redirect you to, um, to Drupal Wiki. We just put it here because it's shorter. Um, and um, we're also publishing uh, updates and news and new achievements uh, about Gander on Tag One blog, uh, which is the right link slash QR code. So if you if you want to follow what's happening in Gander world, I would uh, definitely invite you to check that out. Um, and now we have a short demo. Uh, it's pre-recorded. Um, because it will be easier and more secure, but it's really, uh, yeah, as you will see, we have a, we have a DDEV add-on that lets you clean up a DDEV environment that has everything you need for Gander in it in a matter of minutes. And this is what we're all going to show now. Uh, Okay, so we are on the documentation page that I just mentioned. And if you scroll down to the quick start section, these are the steps that we will be doing right now. We will literally be copying them over. So first thing that we do, we will create a fresh project with Composer. We downloaded everything. We will add uh, dev dependencies. Um, and now we will create the DDEV environment. Now we have a DDEV environment. We will add an add-on for uh, for Selenium, and currently Selenium doesn't work well with ten point three, so we have to patch it with this patch. The step is in the docs, so you can do that. After that, we add the Gander DDL add-on that, that I mentioned earlier, and uh, now we start the DDL environment. Um, we SSH into it. And we can already start running tests. Uh, we will run a single test now because uh, this test can take quite a while. Um, in the DDEV environment, you will have Grafana, which is this one. Um, and it's currently empty because we are still running tests. And now we can see that we already ran the test twice. 
we already have the traces, but no uh, graph data yet. Just for graph data, we need more data points. And when we run three or four times, you will see that the data points start appearing on the um, on on the graph. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Using this BDEV add-on, you can really start uh, playing with Candor super quick. Um, unfortunately, we don't have add-ons for other tools like Lando. Uh, people have been asking about that. Um, and I think eventually it will uh, be created. But if you want to contribute that, uh, you can check out how the uh, DDEV plugin is set up and you can also take configuration out of it. And it should be quite easy to, to expand it to other development tools. And yeah, let's, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. I, I have to figure out how to go to the next slide. Yeah, like this. Go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, um, could you walk us through maybe, so that's obviously the a much quicker setup process than I think most people were probably expecting. The fact that you can do a demo video in like a minute and 40 seconds or something like that is awesome. Um, but can you talk a little bit about like sort of the consequences or rather the the what it would lead you to, the actions you would take following sort of getting this set up, creating your first assertions and where that would carry you to go next? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, yeah, I'll try to answer it and catch if I miss anything, feel free to chime in. Um, so first thing would be, like just to get familiar with it, obviously, uh, to try it on a few JavaScript tests, try to assert um, on, on metrics. And I think that... Um, in, let's say that you are in a custom project environment and you are using tests. Um, I would start adding assertions just as is, like to your JavaScript tests. Um, this will make sure that things don't get worse. But when you will see what numbers you are asserting on, it might lead you down some interesting path and you might be able to figure out that something is not performing as well as you think it is. Um, so this would be the first thing that I would do. And the second thing that I would do is when you are fixing performance problems uh, to definitely add tests for those so they don't get reintroduced. Or if you already added assertions to a test that is covering something that you are now improving, then of course you will have to uh, improve the assertions uh, to make it pass. But you know, either way, um, use these tools to make sure that the problems do not reappear. And um, those are the first steps because for this, you don't really need any other setup than what you already have, if assuming you already do testing. Um, and then next step would be to to start using the the what we call long term trends dashboard, um, which for Drupal core, as I mentioned, it's scanner.tech1.io, um, and this is the live instance. Um, and if if you want to play with that in your environment for your custom project or as it might even be possible to do it for Contrib uh, with a few modifications. Um, you will have to set up <clears throat> Grafana and OpenTelemetry Collector and uh, Tempo and Prometheus somewhere. Um, so it will be a little bit more work, um, more on the infra side though. Um, but if you have the capacity, you, you definitely should do that. And then <clears throat> you have a job that runs your performance tests regularly, and then you will see these graphs. Um, and the idea behind these graphs is that if you would see that one of the lines at some point spiked up and it stayed there, then you probably did something that is not great. Um, if it just spiked up and down, like here, this could be like random fluctuation based 
uh, caused by you know the server being busy doing something else at that at that point or something like that. Um, and then really start following these graphs and see where it leads you. And then since you already have that, um, then as I mentioned earlier, you can you can when you see that something strange is going on, and here we have the traces for this entire period. And let's say that we are interested in in this one here, which is around 6 p.m. You can you can try to search for it and could be this one. And then you go into this trace specifically. And then here you can see you now all the queries, how long it took for them to execute. Um, this is time to first byte, for example. These are the LCP and FCP and the cache requests. And, and you just go in here and, and, and do a little bit of research to figure out what's going on. It's not as powerful as New Relic, but it's uh, as uh, catch proof. It can be very, very useful in finding performance regressions. Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing is like, if you use a web profiler locally, um, which, and I, I, mean, I used, to, in 2009, I was using Devel a lot. Um, so it gives you, a lot of a lot of the same information and sometimes richer information than this because this is new and uh, like a fraction of the overall thing. But what it does that you but what it does guarantee is that you're seeing information for exactly the same kind of request every time. So it's like if you use Devel locally and you you're logged out or you're logged in or you've got admin permissions or you you clear the cache but then you hit a different page. But then you forgot that you hit a different page before you went back to the one you were testing or anything like that. You get completely different results. And sometimes you think you fixed something and you haven't, or you think you made something worse and you didn't, or it's like, it's, and if you have like four or five steps, every time you make a change, you have to like write your own little test script to go through. So even though you don't get as much information with this, it's, it's always a like to like comparison between the traces and like if it's i mean it could be that it goes wrong but it means that the test is wrong if you're getting different results we did have that a couple of times especially like three months ago when it was all new and the tests were, were showing different results but we found like core bugs and test test issues as a result of that as well um and i think the other thing i mentioned with this is that um like if you have like a, a distribution like an install profile with default content or anything like that if you just like write one performance test that install that like doesn't even need to install right so like it uses your install profile and it just logs in and hits the front page that will give you like all of the database queries executed on that front page all of like the front end assets that are loaded on that page and like once you've done like a front page and like one article like content type or something if that's like where most of the content is that's pretty much most of the pages that most visitors look on your site. Like it's like, it depends how complex the site is, but most sites it's like four or five content types and the front page. So if you're collecting information about those, you've got like a whole load of information and then you can see changes for that. And then there might be areas that you're not testing, but you're testing like a lot more than zero, just with a couple of little tests and a, and a, and a dozen assertions or something. Thank you, Ketch. Yep. Um, Giannis, before you keep going, just letting folks know, we're, I'm already seeing some questions come into Q&A. We're going to be at Q&A very shortly, so feel free to keep getting those in. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so again, gander.tagwan.io if you want to play with the dashboard. So uh, we are, we want you to use it. Um, if you're a core developer, uh, start adding assertions to tests, write performance tests for fixes that you create, start checking out the dashboards that we just showed. And um, we are tagging uh, issues with two tags, Gander for things that are directly related to Gander, like to add features, add metrics, bugs, whatever it may be. Um, and performance testing discovery, are the performance problems that we found using Gander. Um, so if you find any of those, 
please tag them. Or if you want to try to address any of those, you can, you can check out what it's there. Um, if you are a contributed module or team maintainer or uh, a developer, you can start adding assertions to your tests. Um, you cannot have a long-term dashboard out of the box because that requires a separate runner, which we do have, thank you, DA, for core, but DA cannot uh, provide that for every module. It's just not financially feasible. Uh, and the reason why we need a separate runner, ideally like a separate machine, not like a virtual server somewhere in cloud or something like that, is to have consistent resources available. Because then we have these graphs that are, graphs that are reliable. If we have, are running these tests in an environment where something else is running at the same time, the results could be all over the place and they won't be useful. Um, if you find a sponsor for a runner or if you can provide it yourself, I heard it might be possible with GitLab now to point um, this test to your own runner that you maintain yourself. And it will still run in Drupal's GitLab environment. It just the tests will execute on, on the machine that, that you provided. Um, so it is possible to have that. Um, and then if you decide to do that, you can uh, you will have to host Grafana somewhere. Um, the simplest solution is Grafana Cloud which has a free tier. And I think for the amount of usage that we would see in our use case, it's more than enough. The main two downsides that I think we found is that the data retention is only 15 days. It's not great, but it's something. And I think that you cannot have it publicly accessible. You have to log in to be able to see the data. Um, but if you're fine with those limitations, then Grafana Cloud might be a good solution. Otherwise, you can self host it somewhere. Uh, yeah, you know, basically the options. Um, and we we want to help early adopters. So if you want to do something like this, please reach out and we will try to help. Um, you can also use it on your custom project, on your client projects project. And it's like, if you already have CI/CD environment, you can start running, you can start adding assertions to your existing performance tests, uh, to existing JavaScript tests. Um, and then if you want to add Grafana and all that into the mix, uh, then it's pretty much the same story as with Contrib. Uh, but if you if you want to do that, also reach out to us. We would like to help. Um, and just spread the love. Tell everyone you know about Gender so everyone can start using it. Write a blog post about it. Um, mention it in the issue queue if you see somebody discussing some performance issues. Um, just spread the love. And with that, I think we can start taking questions. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you again, Giannis, for the um, overview and kind of the thorough exploration. I think one takeaway that I want to share is that this is um, much easier than you might have thought the first time you heard about this, the first blog post you read uh, between the like DDEV setup process or some of the other documentation or taking a look at some of the examples that are already used for performance testing in core. I think you'll find it relatively um, easy to jump into uh, and valuable to explore. So. Going straight into questions, I'll go in time order with the time we have left. So first question, uh, and uh, Catch, I think this will probably be a question for you. All code additions can have a performance trade-off. So with the addition of automated performance testing to core, does or will the core team have a policy on what kind of performance regression or reduction might be allowed with a given code change? Like what's the acceptable performance impact of code changes moving forward? So, so technically, we have had a policy since about 2010, but it was impossible to enforce, and we just could, would commit stuff and find out about it six or 12 months later. Um, we have had a couple of issues 
I think in ten ten point three was really the the ten point two we was really added really late in ten point two. So we kind of got to the point where we had tests running, but there weren't changes that went into ten point two that ran against the tests. Not really. The ten point three the the user access policy issue, um, which kind of gets rid of the super user in Drupal core, makes it like a a service instead lets you add other access policies other than permissions things like that that i think added like one cache query or key value query or one cache tag query and it caught that um and i think there was one thing that we were like it's doing something different we're going to allow the extra query but i think there was one that actually we found out we could get rid of that and optimize in a different way um so it's starting to pick up things and stop them um there's uh, we added um javascript minification in 10 point was it 10.2 i think um and the now that we assert how big the javascript files are we assert them after they've been minified obviously not before um so the the size of the javascript files that we allowed has been reduced so every time we make an improvement if we know if we know we're making an improvement, we can reduce like the quota for how much stuff you can have, and then anything that goes back up to that doesn't get in. Um, but I mean, with every individual issue, it's like, is are you doing more things because you're doing more things that you have to do to do the thing that you want to do, and then it's like you're just gonna have to. But but what will happen is you'll have to like if you add that extra query, you're gonna have to commit the line to the test that adds the query to the expected queries and increases the cache counts and everyone will see what what happened and which issue added it. And then, but then if it's not, like if it's not necessary, then it might end up blocking the patch or or it might increase the priority of another issue. Like um, there's an issue to add key um, caching to the state API. State API currently does individual queries about against the key value store. It can be like 10 on each request. We have an issue to put that into a cache collector. So it's one query that builds up over time. So one cache item that builds up over time. Um, if we do that, every issue that adds a new state query will not be a performance regression. It will just make that cache item a little bit bigger. Um, so it's like if we keep seeing that we have to add new assertions for new key value queries against state, we say, okay, we need to do this the cache collector issue and then it's not a problem anymore. Nice. I just wanted to add one thing there. That was that was a great <laughs> technical response. But I, sometimes there's changes that you know have a mixed mixed impact on performance. So you're doing more work on the server uh, to get more information, and then like concatenating JavaScript was a great example of that. The end result is you you've made something smaller. In WordPress core, we did something where instead of just outputting the you know the content of the page in one run, we process the content twice. We go through the whole content, then we output it, and that enables us to determine what's on the page and only load like associated JavaScript and CSS. So there's an upfront cost. And time to first byte might it might increase, but the end result is a improvement in overall performance. So it's very difficult. I think it's a case by case basis, like you said, but it's a very interesting question. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to keep going here. The next question is performance is often dependent on environment, depending on the hardware it's running on. So we would expect that the tests uh, results will be different on a local DDEV environment versus on a GitLab CI system. So what recommendations do you have for dealing with the differences that a contrib developer might run into when they're adding performance tests to their project? Um, I'm going to take a short crack at this, which is to say, right, the only, the only rational solution that'll keep you from tearing your hair out is to be using uh, a comparative methodology against the same environment over time, whether that's a local environment that you can reasonably well control or better yet, a consistent like runner environment. Um, so I think that's probably going to be most of the answer there, but if anybody else wants to chime in um, about contrib and making sure your comparisons are gonna make sense. Yeah, I mean, um, like Cortez, for example, just use the database cache backend, but one thing we did is we split out those database queries from like all of the other database queries in core. So when you're writing assertions, you're not like the list of queries does not include the cache queries. They're counted separately. They're in their own bucket in the performance data. And that way, if you did swap out to like Redis on your local environment and run tests with the Redis in the tests, you should get the same overall results from the test. 
But the only thing that Cash and Redis makes a difference for is like the raw time to first bite. And that's not going to be the same between like two two runs of the test are going to be like however many milliseconds different. It just is not going to be the thing that is going to cause you problems. Um, so, but I mean, things like, you know, you'd want like JavaScript and CSS aggregation enabled. You wouldn't want to write, like write tests with them disabled because, you know, if you split a file into two, you, you take one CSS file and you make it two CSS files in two libraries for whatever reason, and they're both landing on the same page. It's, it's like the end result is going to make absolutely no difference because when it aggregated, it's back to one file anyway. Um, so it's kind of things like you want a kind of perf like a performance configure, not from production configuration of the site under test. Like it should be somewhat realistic, like dynamic page cache enabled, page cache enabled usually, um, and then write the test to kind of try the different scenarios under that. But other, but in terms of like the actual hosting environment, uh, it's best not to think about it. <laughs> like just yeah, think about it as little enough. as possible. Yeah. Um. Cool. Next question here. We're almost out of time, so we understand if some attendees have to drop, and we'll try and wrap up shortly here at the half hour. But I think there are technically two questions total left. Uh, some one or two in the chat. Uh, have you tried using this with something like Drupal test traits so that you can refresh your performance in the context of the whole site or the whole project site setup um, for confidence in the overall site's performance? Um, I'm not sure necessarily how to answer that myself. Giannis, maybe you have an opinion here about like kind of the purpose of this test framework. I think that sort of the answer is this is less about um, this is less about trying to give you sort of a single metric to follow and more about instrumenting a couple metrics that you can follow over time and instrumenting them, especially if you're talking about custom modules and things like that for particular areas. Um, but yeah, anything to add, Yanis? Yeah, I I already discussed like Drupal test traits and like the, the way those are used with people. And some people had ideas to try to use them, use Gander with, with them. Um, it's currently not supported, but as I mentioned earlier, um, since all the gender logic is in the trait, you could probably pretty easily pull together like a base existing site test from test traits and this trait and make it like a performance test. Um, I think that with the front end metrics, there wouldn't be any issues because those are coming from Chrome and you would be using that. The only thing I'm not sure is about the backend metrics. And uh, for that, Catch, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that one, that's trickier. Um, the, yeah, the front end metrics would work exactly the same. You just need to subclass the Drupal test trait, base class, add a performance test trait, add a couple of things that you could copy over from functional JavaScript tests and it'll work. Um, you can you can like ignore the backend metrics to start with and just get like CSS and JavaScript. Um, one one idea we did have but didn't implement is collecting the because because the performance metrics are collected on the site under test. You could enable the performance collection module on in your site that you're installing with DTT. Um, but you'd still need a way to communicate that back to the test class. Um, but what you could do is have a like an end of request thing that adds a adds headers and then pull those headers out in the test. But that's work that hasn't been done. So it's a bit more work, but you can take like you collect them at the end, you stick them in the foot of somewhere in some JSON, and then you have the web test pass the JSON out of the thing, and then you've got all of those query numbers, all of the query stuff like that. The only issue with that is that it's it's less production-y because you're adding things to the page that weren't on the page. So it's a bit more interfering with the site under the test, but that might be what we have to do with Drupal test traits because it's a real site and there's there's a limit to what you can do. Okay. Uh, there was one more question that had to do with like load testing and whether this tool is relevant to load testing type applications. I don't think we really have time to um, kind of answer that. 
it's not specifically about the notion of, hey, can we bring the site to the knee to its knees and all these things? Because load testing also has a component about what infrastructure you're running on, and this is more about the application itself. Um, yeah. But um, so we I, like I, to say that this is these are performance tests, not load tests. So it's it's a different kind of tool. Yeah, it's not. It's not meant for load testing, but if you want to try, we at Peg One are developing a load testing framework that is written in Rust, and it's called Goose or Goose Gander. No, um, <laughs> so if you want to check that out, um, it's on our GitHub, GitHub.com/slash/peg1consulting/slash/goose. It's uh, pretty cool and very fast. And one Wait. last thing on that on that question, like the the function of JavaScript. Testing core, they what they use Chrome driver, so it's Chrome hitting the site, so it does actually load the JavaScript and the CSS, and it does actually render the page, and that's that's how we get um, us contemporary paint. So it's like, but but you can't use it for legal, um, load testing because it's single threaded, so like you have to have like a really slow site to to bring it down with with PHP. You know, it would it would be a lot of effort. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So Goose is coming along to match the gander sometime soon. But with that, I've got to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of myself at the Drupal Association, Adam at Google, um, Nat and Giannis from Tag One. And thank you to all of you for attending today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll send out a recording and maybe make the slides available as well. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And thanks all for attending. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.